Okay. If, I, if everyone's ready, I think I'll start up. So this is my talk on the convergence of counterfeiting and computer security. Uh, here's the outline, and I'll talk about that here. So optical document security are, is a very widespread uh, feature. You'll see it in many things, even if you don't notice. Um, ID cards, currency are the obvious ones, but also tickets, um, gift vouchers, and anti-tamper seals and food products. Uh, all have some form of um, document security. And as I started looking at this, it seemed that there's a lot of similarities between that field and computer security. And while they have been fairly separate, they're gradually converging. And this can have some very positive benefits because document security is a very mature field. They don't seem to have as many bad surprises as happens in computer security. But on the other hand, there, they are different fields and there could be some negative um, effects when they merge together. And the main reason that they're emerging is that computers are now the document security's biggest problem. While before you might need a sophisticated printing press to make a reasonable color copy, now you can do it with less than $100 for um, a cheap scanner and a cheap inkjet printer. So, so a lot of this talk is taken from a, a book called o o Optical Document Security by Rudolf van, van Rennes. This is an excellent book and the canonical reference for this field. If you're interested in it, it's well worth reading. It's not cheap, it's 117 euros when I last checked, but it might be possible to get it secondhand cheaper. And the main goals of document security are to protect documents against adequate duplication. The word adequate is important there. And to protect documents against ad adequate modification, and that's forgery. The word adequate is there because counterfeiters only have to get past the first inspection in general. If you're trying to counterfeit currency, then as soon as it's out of your hands, it's not your problem anymore, you've got whatever you wanted. And the counterfeiters have costs, and they want to limit these. And as with the issuing body, banknotes are expensive, and they don't have that long, uh, um, that long a life. They might cost, say, 20 percent of, um, uh, say, 20 US cents. And when they get destroyed, the bank has to reissue another one and makes a loss on that. And as well as the physical, the monetary loss by a banknote being counterfeited. There's also the loss of confidence in the currency. If, this, if there's so much forgery going on, then the confidence in that currency can go down and that can have huge economic impact. When you're trying to design optical document security, the starting point is the inspection. If Someone can't read the document, no matter how good your security is, there's no point in having it. And the field has mainly categorized inspection into three different categories. There's first line, so this may be um, a cashier when you're paying some money in a supermarket or a waitress. These have very limited time. They haven't had much training. The environment isn't ideal. It might be dark, um, it might be windy, and they've got little, if any, equipment, maybe an ultraviolet light. Probably not. Then there's the second line. These people have more training, simple equipment, some automated checks like a chemical pen, which when you put it on the banknote will change color. And this might be an example of a bank cashier. And then the third line is forensic specialist. This might work for a testing laboratory or for the government themselves. They've got fairly sophisticated equipment and they also have special knowledge which wouldn't be disclosed to the public. So there are several goals of op optical document security. One of the most well known is the duplication resistance. The defenses are all designed to prevent a particular type of duplication. So after the inspection process, you have to think what techniques are available to the, the counterfeiters. This used to be printing presses uh, and the defense against this was to have multiple colors. Then it was the camera and the defense against that was to have very fine Gilioche lines, which are hard to duplicate. 
Then it was a colour photocopier, and I'll talk about some defences in that, and now it's scanner and ink jets. While under a microscope, a banknote will look, a uh, counterfeit banknote will look very different uh, from the original banknote. When you look at them far away, they are very difficult to differentiate. The reason is that even though the printing techniques are very different, rather than uh, uh, offset litho or intaglio, which we'll talk about later, printers use half toning, but it's at sufficiently high resolution that when you look at it from a normal distance and normal lighting, it looks almost identical. So the techniques to prevent computer copier, whether this is in a photocopier or a PC, is to use the differences between human and computer vision. One of these, and probably the most well-known, is optically variable devices. Whereas printers, inkjet printers, can only produce images which are identical regardless of what angle you look at them. Uh, there are techniques to produce security devices which change depending on the angle of the light source and the angle of the viewer. Probably the most well-known is watermarks. These are quite an old technology. They work by putting the paper under pressure when it's being produced. And, but even though these are well-known, they're surprisingly effective. The way they vary is that when you look at them through transmitted light, um, you can see dark patches, and on reflected light, it's inverted or sometimes completely invisible. And there's more modern ones that use um, interference and diffraction. These are called iridescent effects, where it, the image changes depending on the angle of the light source. So uh, perils show this because of the thin films when they're formed. And there are also um, multi-layer microstructures, which cause more interesting effects and are, light and are also harder to duplicate. And then there's also holograms, which show depth, and kinograms, which show movement when you tilt them. So the, if, if those are on the document, then that causes some problems for digital copying. But it might be possible to make a copy and then put some approximation of the extra optically variable devices on top of it. In the case of watermarks, if people don't hold up to the light, then it's adequate just to print the watermark in grey and people don't notice a difference. But for the rest of the document, you want some way to differentiate a copy made from a, a digital printer and the original. And the way you do this is taking, advantage, taking account that digital devices have a limited resolution and it's tuned for human recognition. So if you look at it normally, then it will, the original and duplicate will look identical. But the Nyquist limit kicks in. This is where if you sample an image at less than double the frequency of the image, you get some, you're not able to reconstruct it. And if you choose the patterns carefully, then you get Moiré patterns. And one way of doing this is screen angle modulation, which I'll show a demonstration of. This is a 10 euro banknote, and I've zoomed into a section. Hopefully you can see that the lines are altering in angle, but when you look at them from far away, they're sufficiently close that it looks like a um, plain gray image. But when you resample it, the Moiré effects kick in and you see some, you see distortion, wavy lines on the right-hand side, curved lines on the left-hand side, and this indicates that it's been sampled at too low a resolution. And of course, there's other techniques. Uh, banknotes are made from a cotton linen blend of paper rather than wood pulp. This makes them more robust and it also makes them feel very different quite a reliable way of telling a counterfeit, as if it feels strange. And this is very effective because the people handling banknotes handle banknotes all day long. And if they notice something different, then they'll flag it and have a look at it in more depth. Another property of banknotes is that they use non-fluorescent paper. Normal paper is whitened by adding a 
whitening, whitening agent, which fluoresces blue under ultraviolet light, and whereas banknotes have something that, that's um, a, a different whitening process. So that's why you see one of the reasons you see people holding banknotes under fluorescent light. Another possibility is fluorescent security fibres. The euro has that. If you hold a euro under a UV light, you'll see multicoloured fibres in a random pattern throughout the banknote. Um, this isn't 100% uh, secure. Well, nothing is, but a counterfeiter called Wesley Weber in Canada pretended to be a nightclub owner and wanted tickets that didn't fluoresce, so he was able to get non-fluorescent paper. And it can also have false positives. If you accidentally wash a banknote in the washing machine, then there are whitening agents inside the washing powder which deposit on the banknote and cause it to fluoresce. One other problem with a four-color process is that it can't reproduce all colors. In fact, it can only do a small portion of what a human eye can see. But the human eye isn't very good at recognizing when one color is different to something that you've seen in the past. So what banknote designers do is have difficult color pairs. So bright orange and light brown look different when you look at them, but when you print them in the standard printing press with four colors, then they look the same. They also use specialized printing techniques. One of the main ones is intaglio. This is where you cut grooves in a sheet of metal, maybe copper, maybe aluminum. You put uh, gel-like ink into that, put that on top of the paper and press it down with extremely high pressure. That causes the paper to buckle under the weight and bulge out when the ink has been deposited. So when you feel a banknote, you'll be able to feel the intaglio printing. There's also registration windows. These are some way that you can see through a banknote and compare whether the back is properly aligned with the front. The euro has that, in the, the 10 euro has that in the top right hand corner. This is a useful feature because a standard printing press for non-currency prints on one side, flips it over and prints on the other and there's a slight alignment problem whereas a currency printing press prints on both sides simultaneously. And then there's serial numbers. These are printed using letter press, so they feel different again from intaglio. And it's, even though you think with a computer you could put serial numbers on top of it without any much problem, most counterfeits found don't have um, unique serial numbers. So when you compare those two banknotes together, they've got serial number you know it's fake. Another technique is dermochromic ink. So this is a ticket. The reason that you won't see techniques like this in banknotes is it's not very durable, it rubs off, but it's, it was first used in the 1992 Winter Olympics and this is for an event in Cambridge. You can see the blue band across to the back of the ticket. If you warm it up through rubbing it, or in this case some warm water, then when you take it away, it's changed colours. It's the same technique that's used in T-shirts. So as well as non-duplication, you have binding integrity. You want to keep information unchanged and linked to other information on the same device. So in an ID card, you want to make sure someone can't change the photo um, and put, it on, put a different photo on an ID card, particular name or nationality. And you don't want someone to be able to change the the value of banknotes. This isn't much of a problem in the Eurozone because the banknotes are very different colours and very different size depending on their value. But in the US, um, certainly the old notes were quite similar. So it wasn't uncommon for someone to bleach off the numbers on a banknote and then print new, new numbers on it. And then it looks like a fairly legitimate banknote. It's got the watermark, it's got intaglio printing. Um, more recently, they started changing colours to prevent that. And there's other talks in, at the conference on biometrics, and this is another example of binding. Rather than binding information together, you're binding a person um, to an ID card or some other document. And this is a problem in ID cards that don't use biometrics other than photos, because if you can't change the photo, then maybe you can change your appearance. There was one case in the UK where someone took a driving, uh, 150 driving tests for other people. And the way he did this was not by changing the photo and the driving license, but just by dressing up in wigs and moustaches to look like the person who was going to take the test. 
and this worked for quite a long time. And this is quite similar to the integrity constraints in crypto systems. So a Kerberos ticket should only be valid for a certain time and key and type information to stop you using a key designed for, say, encrypting pins for encrypting other data. So if you want to prevent forgery, then you, there are two routes. There are prevention, which they do, and also detection. And then you have to have a sort of legal process for punishing people and deterring from doing it in the first place. One way of doing this is um, preventing washing, so preventing people put solvents on um, secure documents and changing information. So you add ink, which bleeds on that solvent. There's chemical reactions, which you can try to prevent by putting a chemical which reacts badly, and mechanical re removal, like rubbing. So you coat with um, a material which, when you rub on it, it breaks up and changes colour. And this is very difficult when the document producer can't control the type of ink used, so checks. One example of this is a fraud where the criminal gave the customers lots of very expensive free pens, but the ink in it was quite easy to remove, so an accomplice came along, got a check, and then changed the value on it. And in the forensic detection phase, you can use various techniques to identify whether um, something has been added, which the, uh, the prevention methods can't do, um, and also see if it's been changed. Inks that look the same under visible light look different under different colors of light. And here are some experiments I'll be doing with um, checks. On the top row, it's ballpoint and middle row roller ball, and at the bottom, fountain pen ink. And you can see that different solvents have different effects on it. At the left hand side, it's water, which causes a certain amount of bleeding. Two propanol, which causes a lot of bleeding in the ink, so it would be very noticeable. And cyclohexane, which only removes the ballpoint ink, but doesn't cause very much damage, at least in the visible spectrum. Perhaps in other spectrums, it's more detectable. A more modern technique is to cover documents with a um, thin film. Uh, so ID cards, modern ID cards will have that. The film is very weak. It's weaker than the glue, so if you try to remove it, it shouldn't be possible to do so intact. But that causes a problem for the photographs because they have sharp edges and can cut through it. So maybe you have to reinforce around the photograph. Another technique is to have a thin, uh, layer of ink which is initially on the film but transfers to the photo if you try to remove it and that should be hard to duplicate. There are problems with this. If the attacker can apply the film then they can do so very poorly and make it easy to remove later or in chemical seals, cold seals, they can take up to 30, 36 hours to actually become secure so the attacker could remove it later on. Hot seals don't have this problem. And one suggestion that hasn't really been used is to bind the chip and a card together by having a cryptographic key on a machine-readable hologram, and the hologram is very difficult to remove from the card, and this key is necessary to um, activate the chip. So when you're trying to design a, a document, a secure document, you start from risk analysis. This is the same as using safety critical systems, business, and security. You identify a threat model. What are you trying to prevent? What are the abilities of your attacker? And then you try to make this more uh, concrete and put it into a security target, which specifies measured criteria. Then you have to integrate with the other requirements. Sometimes security will interfere with durability. Holograms aren't as durable as other security features or they might not just look nice, and if people don't like your banknotes, then you've got a problem even if they're secure. You evaluate the cost and benefit. Um, you have to take into account the likelihood of attack and damage. If an attack is very unlikely, then there's probably not much point in defending it against it, particularly if that defense is going to be expensive, or if it's not going to cause very much damage, then you can tolerate a certain amount of noise. And then you repeat the requirements engineering process until all these requirements are somehow optimum. And that's the same as you do in the cyclic model of, of uh, computer program design. 
And what you will likely end up with this in the good system is defence in depth. This has been something that's stated for computers for quite a long time. If you have a security layer, then as soon as someone gets through that, then your system is completely broken. So computer security systems and banknotes should have uh, several levels of checks and defences. One reason for this is, depending on the circumstances of checking, how much time you have, how many resources, you might be able to use different techniques, perhaps ones that are quick to check, so it be good for first line, are not very secure, so you want something better for the second and third line, so you use different things. And if you can't prevent everything and you, there's no such thing as 100% security, then use punishment as a deterrent. One controversial point is that colour photocopiers and laser printers sometimes leave signatures. Sometimes this is intentional. The, um, I think Canon colour printers, uh, colour photocopiers leave a yellow barcode and there's some research done in Purdue which shows that laser printers have a characteristic pattern. But this is fairly effective when you're talking about £20,000 photocopiers, but when you're talking about cheap inkjet printers, then you go, go to a shop, you make sure there's no CCTV, you buy it with untraceable cash, and then you destroy it as soon as you've used it. And this is similar to audit logs that are in computer systems, particularly banking systems. You're trying to defend against insiders who do have access to your system and there's no way to pre prevent it. But if you detect something bad has happened, then you can see who did that. So as I was looking at this field, I noticed that there were very many similarities between computer security and real life security. And this isn't new. Matt Blaze um, has published a paper at the Cambridge Security Protocols Workshop called the Human Scale Security Protocols um, uh, Project. And he showed that there are many things you do in real life, um, restaurants, airport security, voting, that can be modelled with um, standard protocol techniques. And when you, look at when you look at real life security in computer science fashion, then you can see some things that other people haven't noticed. For example, the, through modeling locks, master key locks as a um, cryptographic oracle, he was able to rediscover a uh, vulnerability in master key locks. And just as locks are becoming computer based, the anti-counterfeiting field is mainly computer based. So the two fields are merging. Berkeley bribery and blackmail isn't new. Uh, it's a problem for most fields of security and as the same in computer security, there's no point in having a good firewall if you can break in and steal the computer. And attackers will do this if this is the easiest way in. There, with bribery and blackmail, the problem you have is that insiders are your enemy and they have access to your system, they've got knowledge, they've got friends who might be able to increase their privileges and protecting against those is extremely hard. Similarly with counterfeits and forgeries. If you can break into a document issuing plant and steal some original material, then there's nothing you can do to identify whether that's a fake or not. Uh, it might be possible to use some things on small scale. For example, in, UK, in the UK, prescriptions issued by doctors for medicines are sometimes stolen. And the way they prevent these being used is that doctors will have some convention with the local pharmacist of how they fill out a prescription. And if, these don't, if they don't match, the pharmacist knows something's up. And also, most secure documents are numbered and numbered extremely close to when they're produced. So hopefully if you steal them, they'll be numbered and later on someone can revoke them. But this is very difficult because most transactions happen offline, so they're not going to check the verification list. And this is true in computer security as well. With SSL certificates, even though they in theory can be revoked, revoked not many people check the re revocation list. I'm sure there's still a lot of computers around that accept the fake Microsoft certificate, which was issued by VeriSign. Another commonality between computer security and uh, optical documents is complexity. In computers, the more, more complex a uh, system is, it's 
more difficult for both the people analysing it for good reasons and attackers to understand. So it's a double-edged sword. SSL had vulnerabilities in it because, uh, for quite a long time because no one had understood the correct interactions that cause it to do something incorrect. And, but in document security, complexity is considered quite a beneficial thing. Holograms are well known how to duplicate, but they're complex to do so. Same with most optically, optically variable devices. Intaglio printing is a very old technique, but it requires expensive equipment to do and kinograms and watermarks. But it has its disadvantage as well. The more complex something is, the more difficult it is for the inspector to check. And it might be possible to get quite a poor copy through. Then there's the composition problem, which is related. It's well known in computer security that something as secure in isolation when combined with something else can be insecure in either of the component parts. And poor combination of document security can be less secure. So if you use intaglio printing over a watermark, you might not be able to, you might not want to feel the intaglio because you think it's a watermark and you can't see the watermark either. And one problem, so coined the Titanic effect, is when one security feature, say an optical visual device, is perceived to be secure and so visually overpowering that that's the only thing that people look at. So this hinted to security usability, which is an extremely important point. The document's only secure as a checking process. And this is perceived within computer security as well. There was a paper which surveyed various um, skilled people trying to send a PGP message, and most of them failed. Uh, but this isn't something that has improved all that, all that greatly. A lot of security mechanisms are either hard to use or insecure. One way of mitigating this is to educate users, but there's not that much evidence that they're going to remember because their task is to do their job. It's not to, have their, it's not to do their job securely. So you try to make security features self-evident. You want an uh, optical document to feel different or look very different without them having to intentionally check. One way of doing this is standardization. You can have the same logo on different banknotes or have the watermark being the same as the image on the banknote. That's recommended by Interpol and is deployed in most banknotes. The euro and the pound both have that. And there's standard human factors. Related to that is cultural differences. This has bitten some people in computing. For example, Microsoft have had several problems about this. One of the most expensive is where a product was banned because they, mistaked, uh, they made a mistake in colouring a map and sh showed a disputed area belonging to the wrong country. And it's the same in document security. In Oriental countries, um, for example, Japan, if you're giving a present of money to children, it's not uncommon to iron them. But this causes a problem with the new Japanese banknotes, which have a hologram, and it's damaged when you heat it up. So the central banks had to produce an expensive advert advising people not to do this. And there's also politeness. In some circumstances, it might be inadvisable to hold a banknote up to the light or make it obvious that you're checking because it might cause embarrassment. So banknotes should include some way of checking without making it obvious it's checked. So intaglio printing is good, like, uh, good for that because you can feel it just as you pass it over. Then there's security over through obscurity. This is a controversial area. Uh, some people believe in it, some people don't. In computing, I'd say the consensus is generally it's a bad thing. But in most systems, it's, it's more complicated than that. You can't separate the key and the algorithm as cleanly. And it does cause a problem for attackers. So you have to consider whether it's advantageous to disclose something. On one hand, you might get a large number of experienced people looking for flaws and being able to tell you about it. But if people aren't going to do that, then you can make life slightly more difficult for the attacker by keeping it secret. With document security, 
security to obscurity is more popular than it is in computing. There's various discussions in the Renes book that I cited earlier, um, saying that nothing should be disclosed which isn't necessary for checking documents. And this could cause problems as it has caused in computer security. And one of the reasons is that document producers might be underestimating the enemy. They might already have access to the information. There's very well known techniques like Intaglio and, and watermarking. Or they might look at patent databases. Patents have to disclose quite a lot of information in order to be uh, admissible. And the users need to understand the features in order to recognize them. So uh, as I mentioned, the biggest problem is scanners and inkjet printers. So the banks are attempting to do this. One of these is the counterfeit detection system. This was introduced um, by the G, uh, G10 organization, the Central Bank's Counterfeit Deterrence Group, and they termed it the counterfeit detection system. This is in quite a lot of um, both drivers for hardware and for software. It was introduced very quietly, but not long after it was found, uh, not long after the new version of Photoshop was released, which included this, people spotted it when they tried to copy banknotes, which under certain circumstances is perfectly illegal. And that was in January 2004. As there was more discussion and the media pressed the organizations, um, the, it was found that the code was produced by Digimark. There's also some uh, debugging symbols inside the programs which indicate that. But the algorithm isn't disclosed. The companies that produce the software don't even get the source code. And this is what it looks like in PaintShop Pro. If you try to open even a small part of a mic note, this is a dialog box which comes up. If you click on the information button, it will send you to rulesforuse.org, which explains the conditions in which banknotes can be used. Though, if you go here and find out that your use actually wasn't, uh, your use was permitted, there's not much you can do about it. More recently, the banks have produced a counterfeit detection system disabled banknotes, but you could only get these from European Central Bank if you agree to a non-disclosure agreement and also you need it for professional use. So when this came out, people thought it was the Urion constellation. This was discovered by Marcus Kuhn in 2002 when he tried experimenting, um, copying various things in a Xerox color photocopier. If you try to copy a banknote in that, it will say that you're not allowed to copy banknotes. If you keep on trying to do it, then eventually the copier will stop working and you have to call out the service personnel and according to reports they will mention to the various law enforcement bodies that this is happening. The way it works is there's patterns of five dots in British notes. They're slightly more disguised as they are in the Euro notes, but it's the same pattern. Um, Andrew Steer, a mathematician, also found out that the ratios between the angles and the dots can be checked using only integer arithmetic, which is convenient because color photocopiers don't have that many resources. And you want to be able to do stuff without floating point. So what I did after this is try to find out whether this was in fact the truth. And it's not. The Uranian constellation is neither necessary nor sufficient. It's probably not even a factor. Other things I looked at were color histogram. Hewlett Packard printers recognize whether a printout has the same color histogram as a banknote. And if so, it won't refuse to print it, but it will alter the color on it so it looks a bit strange. And it will also alter the registration. So if you use a duplex unit and print on the other side, it will be off more than would be expected. The whole banknote wasn't required, so I wrote a program which would take different areas of the banknote and try to see what, were, what was required. And some extremely small areas were possible to be detected as currency. And these were ones which exhibited um, SAM-like techniques, which I mentioned earlier on. So one problem which we'll come to later is that it might be necessary to have an open source version of this. So for compatibility, I, along with Ben Laurie, started reverse engineering the code. 
We used IDA Pro from Data Rescue for doing the static analysis and Ollie Debug for doing the dynamic analysis for uh, tracing through flow. We used a lot of standard techniques of just reading through the code and trying to annotate it as best as we could. But in this particular case, we also had an additional technique where we run the code um, of just one function through when we opened with a currency image and then we ran through it without and then we compared the difference. You trace back and you'll probably see that a flag is checked or a flag is set and then you find out where that's happened and repeat the process. Another thing I did was break before a function call and look at what the arguments are, try to understand what they're for and what happens to them and then replace these with my own image, some that will show up particularly fe particular features of functions that we are expecting that function to be. So we, we found some parts of the code. It seems to be work in several steps for efficiency reason. It does some course checks which aren't all that reliable but are very fast and if they don't pass then it opens up the image immediately. This means that there won't be more than a few seconds delay when you're opening up non-currency images. So what this stage does, which is not at the start but fairly early on, is it splits the image into segments. These are maximum 128 by 128. They're grayscale. And then it does a domain transform on it. We're not exactly sure what it is. It's something to do with Fourier, uh, it's something to do with a Fourier transform because it depends on frequency. The, high frequencies are in the bottom left hand corner and then as you decrease the frequency you go towards the middle and the top. This is a medium frequency image. It's um, each of the negative values on input on the left hand side is minus eight and is three wide and the same with positive images which are plus eight. And on the other side you can see the output. After this is done the image is sharpened using a very coarse sharpening filter where you can compare each, filter, each pixel to its neighbours and set, that to, uh, set the pixel to be the sum of the number of neighbours which are greater than it. And then you apply a normalisation process. This is also another quite strange function. It's not continuous you compare each pixel to the average of its neighbours by dividing it and then you feed that into what's initially a square function but then it drops off um, after two. And then you do a co coordinate transform. This converts it from uh, what looks like log polar into Cartesian coordinates and from this you extract two arrays by some technique that we haven't got to yet. And you compare each element of the first array to 7 and each element of the second array to 1.9. If there is a position where both are greater than that, then it's flagged as being potential currency and goes on to further checks. So we're still working on reverse engineering that and we'll publish more results as and when we know them. But now we'll move on to some of the proposed legislation on this. The European Central Bank has said that many people have adopted including this code voluntarily, the, um, but they don't view this as a very scalable and long-term process, so they would like to introduce legislation which would require this. There was a consultation which, as far as I know, um, nobody from open source managed to recognise, and the conclusion was that this was a good idea and according to newspaper reports, this was intended to be introduced this, sometime this year, but I haven't heard anything about it, so I guess it's behind schedule. And this has some advantages. Um, Bruce Schneier has said that um, he thought that this will prevent some casual counterfeiting, though this was before it was proposed that there be legislation, and th that's true. It, will cause some problems for casual counterfeiters and probably the most advantageous aspect of this is a teenager who wants to copy some banknotes because they think it will be um, a good joke um, and then subsequently get caught. 
if they encountered this at the start, then maybe that would deter them. But of course, there are bad effects. It's a DRM system, slightly different from most, but it's still DRM. One of the problems is there's nothing I've seen which says that open source will be exempt. And the problem with this is that the detection code is closed source. The, and you can't link that to GPL products without permission of the people who have the copyright. But on the other hand, they don't want to release the source because then potential counterfeiters could remove it. But if it's just stopping teenagers, that might be enough. As if the distributions of binaries include that, then it might be enough to deter them. And then there's the case of how do you permit people to copy currency if they have a legitimate need, not just commercial use, um, which would allow you to use the European Central Bank's images, but non-commercial use. And then there's also the question of what should include this code. The, the GIMP might be one possibility, it's obviously image manipulation, but I've done image manipulation in peril, so should it include it? Then if you say you want to write your own program, should the kernel have it or should GCC have it? So in, in conclusion, the opto document security is an interesting field. It has a lot to teach computer security and possibly vice versa. But because IT is involved in both the attack and defense, they're going to become in the same field quite soon. And this could have quite significant gains, but also the unintended consequences could be a problem and this needs to be looked into. So finally, I'd like to thank the Public Software Fund for funding this project and also the Carnegie Trust for University of Scotland. So does anyone have any questions? Um, I have a question to, uh, concerning security devices. I've noticed on the five euro bill, for example, there's patterns of co-centric hexagons. And um, I've seen it, I think the new $20 bills have it, and I've tried to find, find out something about it, but basically I've just seen that apparently lots of currency have these patterns of concentric hexagon buttons, but nobody really knows what those are about. I would guess, you know that, I guess that that would be screen angle modulation, because the, in the hexagons, the lines will change in angle, and that will cause um, the moiré effects. There might be something else to it. The, for example, in the Uran constellation, it's known that there is some other information included, uh, encoded, but uh, it's, it's not disclosed what it is. Yeah. By any chance, have you run a survey of which world currencies are included in the uh, counterfeit detection system and possibly whether the system can adapt to new currencies? Uh, we haven't tried that. We've only tried a very lim limited number of banknotes because of um, the ones that we've had lying around. The US $20, the new one, um, has both the Urian pattern and is detected by the system. The, all the euros we've tried, uh, all the British banknotes, but we haven't really tried anything else. There are 27 banks involved, so I'd at least expect them to have made sure they're system is included, but it would be interesting to see if other banknotes have this. If so, it would indicate that there's some feature, a generic feature of banknotes that's in there for some other reason that's been detected. If it only detects stuff from that 27 banknotes, then maybe the, there are snippets of the banknotes stored inside the program and it's comparing it to them. Yep. There's a little noticed story in the Dutch press I'm sorry, my throat has sort of gone. Um, uh, there's a little notice story in the Dutch press about a, uh, uh, the police actually saying that they have uh, uh, used and used often uh, serial numbers of uh, printer engines, both color printer engines and also inkjet engines, serial numbers printed on the paper. So this is not the miniature differences between printouts from different printers, but the actual engine serial number, which then leads them to the manufacturer and to the printer serial number, which then leads them to the distributor, the shop, and the customer. And they've actually walked the whole chain on multiple events and actually gotten, uh, gotten to an uh, individual suspect that way. Yes, I've heard about this. It's, the technique was developed by Xerox 
um, in order to, I think, um, make the US government happy with being able to sell colour photocopiers. And since then, they've sold it to other manufacturers. There's an article in it describing it's something very close to the laser, so it would be very hard to remove. And it's on many different types of printers. The only things I've tried is uh, the Hewlett-Packard and a Kaisero that I have access to, and I haven't been able to see them. But I've had confirmation that it does exist in many manufacturers. Any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you.